Hey everybody, Hans Hartley here. Welcome back to my channel. Today I got a very special guest, a friend of mine since 2007. Our first film together was Zombie Farm. This is actor John Philbin. He's been in the movie Children of the Corn, Point Break, Tombstone. He's done it all. He's been in so many movies. And it's an <laughs> honor to have you on my show today. And thank you for bringing me out to your beautiful place. You're up in the hills. Yeah. Staying safe. <laughs> yeah, trying. How's it been, man? It's been great, you know, it's been a long time since I've seen you, so a lot's happened. Yeah. And uh, not all of it good, but all of it ended up being really good for me. I've never been in a better place. I feel really good, lucky, and happy, and healthy, and doing well. That's good. Um, so going, let's go back to when we first met, it was Zombie Farm. It was, was it? Uh, or was it a commercial on the back lot of some, was it a phone or a car commercial on some back lot? I think... It was Zombie Farm. And oh, then, Zombie Farm. Then we met on like a then commercial. Then we did a commercial. Again, and then, and then, I then said, we did hey, the perfect, perfect house. house. Yep. <laughs> You're right. Yep, Zombie Farm. We played two FBI agents. Right. Oh, my God. That's fucking so funny. I'd love to see that shit again. I was the rookie, and he was the he was my... The veteran. The veteran. He was the one that was telling me what to do. And uh, I ended up getting some bolt holes stuck in my stomach. And he said, see, I, you should have worn a vest. I remember that That's line. You should have worn a vest. <laughs> Brian's re-releasing that movie. Good, I want to see it. He's rebranding and recutting the movie. Fuck yeah. For a, a virus type situation. So Good, I want to see it. I yeah. Think, I might have gotten to see it, yeah. But I, I like watching shit over and over again on a computer. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> it, especially when like it's some of your older work and you're like, holy crap, I can't believe I did that a long time ago. Yeah, I can't believe I look like that. <laughs> That's what I always think. Um, I th what were you going to say? No. <laughs> I'm like, when I see, like today I looped for a movie that I just did called Ghost Babe. And I got this mustache on. I play this Italian real estate gangster kind of weird thing. And I'm, I looked, I looked at it because you do a movie and you don't see your work for a year sometimes. Yeah. And we did it in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, it's really funny. I got to see the clips, and I was like, fuck, that's funny, man. That's good. I can't, I look like that. It was just a trip for me. <laughs> I love movies for that reason. They're little time capsules. Exactly. That's one of the reasons why I love being a part of cinema, too, is it's something special that's captured on film that will be there for a long time. Forever, yeah. And you get to watch, watch it and be like, wow, that was fun making that. Yeah. <laughs> so you've been in a lot of a lot of movies. I got fifty three movies. Fifty three, and people know you from Tombstone. Yeah, Tombstone, Point Break, North Shore, Children of the Corn, Return of the Living Dead are probably my five most watched movies. You know, like that are movies. You know. Yeah, and how did you get involved with Tombstone? Tombstone. Uh, Kevin Jari wrote the script, and he put together the most insane cast ever. And he had just seen my picture on his, you know, at his desk. He was directing the movie at the time. And he just sent an offer to my agent. I wasn't home. I was somewhere else. He goes, hey, you got an, you got an offer to play Tom McClowry in Tombstone. The guy's in the, gets killed in the OK Corral. And it's with, you know, Val Kilmer and Kurt Russell and Sam Elliott and Bill Paxton. You know, Power Boot and Steve Lang, do you want to do it? And I'm like, fuck yeah, I want to do it. <laughs> you know, yes, just say yes. Okay, you got to come home. We're going to Arizona. I'm like, great, I'll be there. Fuck, I'm so stoked. I just got the offer. He goes, yeah, your picture matches the guy. He just likes you. Who knows why he, you know, liked me or something he'd seen of mine or whatever. And I'm like, yes. And then I hang up the phone. I go, fuck, as long as I don't have to get like dragged through the mud, you know, crying. <laughs> and when I get there, I read the script. I hadn't read the script. I read the script. And as it turns out, Tom McClary gets shot in the stomach by Val Kilmer, and he actually ends up crawling through the mud to die. And I was like, that's unbelievable. And I fucking had that thought, but they didn't, they shot it, but they never used the scene where I'm crawling through the mud and dying. They, they stayed on the lead actors at the end of the OK Corral. But oh, they didn't use that bit. footage? Is it in the deleted scene? No, it was, just, it was, no, no, no. It was never shot by the A camera. They're like, we don't need this scene. We, want, we don't want to follow this guy crawling through the mud and dying. He's Tom McClowry. We're going to stay on Val, Doc, Holiday, you know, and mm -hmm. Kurt Russell and stuff and watch them walk away and just look at the carnage. You know, we don't, this isn't, not a significant character at that point. Don't need to watch me crawl and die. Well, that was, uh, that must have been, you know, a, a career highlight to be on a Western because a lot of actors and actresses are like, 
I want to do a Western. Yeah, everybody wants to do a Western. If you like Guns and Horses, and I love Guns and Horses, the first Western I did was Young Riders. It was a TV show with Josh Brolin and Steve Baldwin. And I did it out in also Arizona, in Tucson, Arizona. And I was like, this is fun. At one point, I had to get on a, on a ladder and get shot off a ladder that was supposed to be a horse. And I was like, this is a Western, man. I'm, I'm on a ladder. I'm getting My horse is back there, but I'm getting shot off a ladder. But Tombstone, for any actor who is on that set, is a dream come true. Just because everybody was looking at somebody and going, fucking love that guy. You yeah. know, me, I'm looking at 20 actors going, I fucking love these guys. But but guys like, you know, Kurt Russell are probably just looking at Bill Paxson or Powers Booth or Charlton Heston or something going, I love that guy. You know, mm -hmm. and look at these kids. And Sam, Sam, Sam Elliott, man. I mean, I'm just looking at these guys and I'm working with them. We're just hanging out talking. So that's a dream. For an actor, now I'm gonna go get on my horse and go shoot some guns. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's That's cool as awesome, it gets, man. That is so if cool. If you like that sort of shit, it's as cool as it gets. Absolutely, man. And so let's go into the perfect house. Okay. We met on that commercial. We saw each other again. I said, "Hey, man, I'm doing a film in New York." And you said, "I want to do a film in New York, right?" Who wouldn't? A film in New York. That's right. And it was called The Perfect House. Right. And there were several characters that you looked at playing and it was the, the the dad that didn't return the weed whacker correct that's right now you went through um you went through quite a time with that the weed whacker scene who wouldn't want to work in new york in a horror movie and then i get the script and i see the part i'm gonna play i'm like okay yeah it's not in new york city it's in niagara where was it buffalo, buffalo. it's in buffalo, buffalo new york which is different at the time i am a full-blown alcoholic I am a full-blown alcoholic. We get to the set and, you know, I shoot a scene or two and I'm like, I got one more scene to do, which is the weed whacker scene where the whole day I'm like passed out. Yep. And then I only wake up while I'm getting tortured and killed by a weed whacker. And I'm thinking, fuck, I'm going to drink tonight. I can drink. I can do this thing. It'd be probably good for me to do this thing hungover. And I, they brought in a magnum thing of wine for the entire casting crew. And I drank three quarters of it up by myself. I stole it, went upstairs, and drank, you know, the equivalent of three bottles of red wine. There's probably, I left oh one bottle in there. Goodness. And I started to spin and I started to head towards a blackout. The producer gave me a ride home. On the ride home to my room, I think I had lost my mind. I heard I'd said and done things that I didn't know about, I don't remember. I get to the hotel and I'm like, I'm in trouble. I like was so sick, I was puking, and then I went, I think I might die tonight, I think I had alcohol poisoning. So I opened the room to my hotel door and grab a pillow, I'm in my boxers, and I crawl out so that my head is leaning out the door into the hallway in case I die. Someone can get me. So, I can't talk oh, okay. on the phone. Whoa. And at some point, the lead actor, who I think is gonna kill me the next day, the lead actor male, comes out of the elevator, comes down, walks by me, looks just looks down at me, steps over my head and walks to his room and closes the door. What? D Dusty did that? Dusty. It's okay. He's seen me before. He's like, what the fuck is this guy fucking doing? <laughs> you, if you, I couldn't talk though. I was like, I couldn't talk. And he comes out of his door, walks back, forgets something, goes and gets something. I think when he comes back, I'm going to say something because I need help. Comes out of the elevator, comes back, steps over my head and goes in this door and shuts the door and I'm thinking, fuck, I am all alone in this. I've done this to myself. I'm classic hotel room, dies, you know, dies in a hotel room. But I didn't die. I made it through the night. I had my alarm set. I got up. I fucking took a shower. I went downstairs and I was there and he, he, he came and I go, ha, huh, did you see me last night? And he's like, yeah, I saw you, brother. I've been there before. I've been there. And uh, that was a, oh, that was a hard day on the set. I think the director was so mad at me because I drank everyone's wine and then got sick that he was behind the other room. I heard this anyway, just going hit him in the face with the weed whacker, man. Get closer, harder. Get him in the face. I'm just like, uh, but the, it was a prop, so it didn't really hurt, you know. No, but I was like, yeah, it was just squirting out, it was just bloody squirting water. out blood. Yeah, so it didn't hurt, but I know he was just so upset with me. But, hey, I couldn't, you know, I was like, it was one of those cases where I was very sick, very in my disease. Yeah. Since then, I got so, I've been sober almost six years now. But that was one of my low bot low bottoms, you know, to do that 
so disrespectful to give in your disease and just steal everyone's alcohol and then get go to the point where you're in a blackout and sick you know like it was gross but it was Holy funny God. now to me yeah. funny <laughs> to me i've told that story and amy and people are just laughing so but you know when you don't have the disease and you don't see it as a survival mm -hmm. lesson it's not funny yeah that's well i'm glad six years now yeah six years that's good that's good other shit happened between now and then because that was 10 years ago and I only it, have six years oh of sobriety. Man, it was 10 years ago. So there was some more bouncing, 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 or swirling the toilet, we call it. I ended up in jail, in LA County Jail. I had to do 30 days, but I got released after like 16. It was awesome. But I had a misdemeanor weapons, fucking horrible charge that I was just in a blackout also. And that's when I got, I, I had my LA County Jail Jesus, AA Jesus, come to me and just go, yeah. you don't have to live this way anymore you never have to drink again. You never have to end up in jail incarcerated again. And it was gnarly and scary in there. I talk a lot of stories about it, you know, the other, you know, last night with my friend, but I never get to tell those stories. Not that, and I don't want to tell them here, but it's just like, it was a real great experience for me to hold as my bottom, as one of the reasons why I don't drink or do drugs anymore. There you go. Yeah. Pretty Six stoked. Six years, man. <laughs> You'll keep at it. You, you. And the, the current work that you're doing, um, do you get a lot of this work on your own? Or yeah, you... I get it all on my own. Okay. I don't have an agent or anything like that. I'm retired from SAG. When I got out of jail, I was like, fucking broke. I have no job, no prospects. And I called my friend. I don't know. And he goes, you know, if, are you 55? And I go, yeah, I just turned 55 today. It's my birthday, whatever. And he goes, you can, you can apply for early retirement pension SAG. And I went, I can? I'm going to retire right now. And I, said, I called up SAG. Oh, wow. I retire today. So I've been receiving a pension. I receive a pension for the rest of my life. It's a SAG pension. It's a little bit of money, but it's made me, it's helped me survive, you know, going through that time. Now I'm working and stuff like that. I, plus, I, I'll get my pension. And it doesn't interfere with your SAG work if you get a SAG movie or something. You just, those get reported. And if it's over $8,000 or something like that, you don't get your pension that month. Mm -hmm. And it kicks back in the following month. So it's, oh, it's okay. for the rest of your life till you die. And it's awesome. Save my life. SAG. I love it. I love SAG. Yeah, they actually were very helpful during the... The past Pandemic. six months. Yeah. Yep. They gave us all, you know, X amount of money Ooh, if you good. applied for it. Right. So good for you. That that really helped out. But a you lot. were working through the pandemic. I wasn't. Oh, you weren't they I was they took a little hiatus. March thirteenth, our show completely shut down. Oh. And they were like, Oh, it's gonna be about two weeks and then two weeks turned into a month. A month turned into two months and then two months turned into six months and we're all wanting to know like, when are we going back to work? When are we going back oh. to work? Yeah. That's good. Good for you then. It was Sag that long. And so SAG helped out. They had a emergency fund for everybody. Right. If you applied, you showed them your bills and stuff. And they're like, all right, here's your... SAG's awesome. Here's your money. So... Here's your money. Here's your money that you put away from all the... It's your money. Don't feel guilty about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they did, it did come in handy. And, um, no shit. The, you get all your work on your own. Do oh, you yeah. have filmmakers that reach out to you because of your past work? Hey, I really love your work. I want to put you in my film. Yes. You know, I'm 60 years old. I did a bunch of, I used to, I was an, I used to say, when people ask me, I used to be an actor in the eighties. I was an actor in the eighties and nineties. Then I didn't work for 15 years. And then, uh, I, I was teaching surfing. I still teach surfing. And then, um, I just got back into it when I got like little moments of sobriety. Like people will go, Hey, you were in. Return of the Living Dead or Children of the Corn or, or Tombstone or Point Break. Are you, you know, are you alive? Are you able to work? You know, and then if I'm sober, if I'm if I'm alive and healthy, they're like, hey, will you be in my movie? And I'm like, yeah. And then sometimes I relapse like I did on Perfect House. But yeah, they just come to me rarely. Not enough, but it's fun. I just do it for fun now. And they I get thrown bones like this, like this movie Undateable John, which is really my biggest film. I'm the lead in the film with Daryl Hannah and Tom Arnold and it's fucking hysterical. It's on Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime. Undateable John. Undateable it's, John. I'm so proud of it. And, you know, it's one of those movies that was super low budget. Joan Jett, you know, produced it and she did the music and she's in it. Margaret Cho and some cool people. And it's about someone. Yeah, it's really funny. I love it. But yeah, and this last one, Ghost Babe, Braden Bacha and Annie Oris. The director's Pipe Delgado. And it's fucking really weird and funny i just saw my part and i'm just this crazy over the top character and i really enjoyed it so yeah they just come to me and say you want to do this little part in this little film and i always say yes 
I don't say as long as I'm not dragged to the mud, you know, and I just say, I, I read the script and then I say yes. Cause it's fun. That's awesome, man. Undateable John. I have, I have Amazon Prime, so I have to. You have to watch Undateable to John. Watch I'm going to watch it. Fuck, it's insane. You won't believe it. You'll go, fuck, dude. That's incredible. <laughs> that's what people say, except for my dad, who doesn't say stuff like that. But everybody else who sees it goes, yeah, that was hysterical, man. That's funny. And you did, you got that on your own, too? Yeah. I'm just, I got it on my own. I don't have any, I don't, no one's, I don't have yeah. an agent or anything, you know, and I, I don't think having an agent would really help me either, but I'm not sure. But yeah, I just like do it part time. I teach surfing, and I any acting jobs that come around, I get. I'm not, I'm not really that much of a hustler, but but I did. Uh, I just did another little low budget horror movie in this studio. It's called like Dog Face Bikini Pool Party Massacre, and it's just this like Friday the Thirteenth kind of takeoff that they're hoping to make sequels and franchise, you know, and franchise, you know. But you never know low budget horror movie where I just play a construction worker that has a relationship with the killer. And, uh, that was fun. Yeah. So yeah, people just say, Hey, are you around? Are you available? Will you do this little part in my little movie? All right. Surfing, surfing, surfing. You live close to the water. I live in Topanga Canyon. Yes. You go down there often every I, day? No, not every day. I don't surf every day. I don't teach surfing every day, but I teach surfing about three or four times a week. I only surf when the surf's good and the surf's good about on average one day a week, you know, but that's just, they come in swells, you know, so I'll surf for like two days or something and take a break and I'll teach. I like teaching when it's really small and that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Right now I'm teaching this guy, Jay McInerney, who wrote Bright Lights in Big City and I'm out there giving him lessons and I'm talking about him. This guy's a fucking charger. He's in perfect shape. He's 60 something. And we're talking about where he's lived. I go, what do you do? Because I don't Google my clients. And he's like, I'm a writer, you know, like what kind of stuff? I've written a couple of screenplays. Oh, you have? Like what kind of, what kind of screenplays have you written? He's like, oh, I wrote the novel Bright Lights, Big City. And I'm like, Jay McNary. That your name, you're James McNary. And that, that, that book was a seminal book of the 80s, urban life in the 80s. And it just changed literature for young people and, you know, film. It wasn't, a, the film didn't do justice to the novel, but. He, and we knew a bunch of the same people, and it was because that's where I'm from. The '80s, I got book fucking was such a big part of, of mine. Everybody I know, and he mentioned some other people, and I knew them all from the '80s in Hollywood because that's when I was like working actor. And it's so funny, Peter Farrelly, you know, and Brett Easton Ellis. It was really cool. I it was I had an epic day. So yeah, I teach surfing down in mm -hmm. Malibu to anybody, but I started teaching surfing for the movies to Kate Bosworth for Blue Crush, and I went, oh, I can teach. I could teach surfing to actors who need to know how to play surfers in the movies because I got to play a surfer in a bunch of movies. And so I, I didn't see anybody doing that. So I did it and it, went, it gave me a new career. It was really a lot of fun. And I traveled around. I got to do little parts in movies like like taught Helen Hunt how to surf. And she gave me a little part in her movie. She, she wrote a character about me in Ride, which I got a producer credit for. And then she put me in Soul Surfer, which I worked on in Hawaii for a while. So it was, it's, it's really been an interesting journey how I was a surfer and then I became an actor. And then I got to be an actor in surf movies. Like North Shore. Like North Shore yeah. and Point Break and then a couple others. And then I got to be this and those had some kind of legs to them, you know. And they really kind of changed my life. That character of Turtle in North Shore has... As it turns out, this little low budget, you know, Universal Studios film, North Shore, that nobody really saw in the theaters, grew as a cult movie with VHS and with cable. And now there's three generations of fans. The fan base is much larger than it ever was. And there's websites about it. And I'm on a t shirt, you know, my character, not me. <laughs> my character's on a t shirt. People, I have fans from all over the world because of this little tiny movie I did in the 80s. And, you know, I'm grateful for it. I used to kind of, everything that was on my resentment list is now on my gratitude list, you know? Yeah. About working in Hollywood, you know, and opportunities I've had that, you know, I used to look at and like, oh, that was not a good thing. And now I look at it and go, that was great. I'm so lucky. I'm so grateful. So that's that's been a really interesting journey. My dad used to go, when are you going to quit this surfing thing? And I was like, never. And now I work teaching surfing and I work in movies because of my work in surfing movies, mm. which is just the weirdest thing. But that's, that's what happened with me. So I'm really, I'm lucky in that way. And it's been great. I enjoy it. That's all meant to be. Yeah. And how do people, um, if they want to get surfing lessons, how do they find you? 
Mostly I work through referrals, but I have a website. It's prosurfinstruction.com. Prosurfinstruction.com. And that's, you know, or they can just Google John Philbin, which is my name, John Philbin, or it, but I mostly work through referrals. The fans of like Tor Tombstone or North Shore or Point Break, they can, if they're real true fans of that, they can, you know, look me up and just Google me and my numbers are, I'm pretty open. Like, yeah, come, I'll give you a surf lesson. You can ask awesome. me anything you want. Yeah, I'll put the uh, link in the description below too, so you can check it out. Ta-da, yeah, just tell me where, you, where what, who, who, you know, directed you to this, to, to me, you know. <laughs> there we go. Credit, where credit is due. Um, and in closing here. Closing? I just yes. fucking got warmed up. Okay, I'm, go ahead. <laughs> in, closing. in closing, do you have any advice that you would give to young aspiring actors that want to move out here and start the push to go to Hollywood and how to keep their careers just moving forward and not giving up, not quitting? Yes, I do. I do. Based on my personal experience, I was spoiled when I was, how long do I have to say this stuff? Oh, like five minutes. Okay. I was yeah, spoiled when I was younger. Congratulations to you about your consistent job on a series. Thank and you. Staying on it for so long on a, on a big series, Animal Kingdom. But, um, you know, I had to be an actor when I was younger. I didn't know anybody in the business or anything. And I went to a conservatory of fine arts, USC, and studied acting in Los Angeles. One, to make sure I liked Los Angeles. I wasn't sure I could like it. The business has changed, obviously, since 1983, which is when I started. But studying acting and what the craft of acting is so that you really understand the tools so that if you get an opportunity, you're not like, oh, you know, well, I got an opportunity, basically, you know. So you've got skills. You know it's a craft, and you studied it, and you take it really serious. But the business side of it, which I was very fortunate for the first 15 years of my career. I was enthusiastic, but, and I got good jobs that went on to become kind of cult films. And I'm very lucky for that. At the time, I didn't really understand or appreciate how lucky I was. And I took it for granted that it would be like that always. And it wasn't, I would go away on these long surf trips. I'd do a movie and go away for three months to go surfing. Cause that was important to me. And it's become part of who I am and I'm grateful for it. But the business side of the thing, these guys are in the office every day, looking at screens and sub making submissions. And they're working their asses off to get actors opportunities. And I was going, hey, don't worry, I'll be back in three months. And they're like, you're not taking your, you're not making your career your priority. And I wasn't. I did it first. Then I got some good luck. I got some fortune. In the 80s, it was very much easier for a young white male to get a job in Hollywood if you had skills and you had certain looks. That, those days are over. Now everybody's competing. And because of the change of reality TV, you know, that's changed the business. So in order, if you've got to do it and you come out to Los Angeles, you know, and you want to be taken seriously, you got to take it very seriously and make it a priority in your life and, ha and be grateful for every opportunity and be kind to people like you are. That's why you've been working on the show for six years, seven years or whatever. Mm -hmm. You're nice to the people. You're consistent. You show up. You're not a drunk. You know, you're not drunk stealing their drugs and their alcohol and not able to perform the next day, insulting everyone on the set. Don't do that. But, um, you know, and if you're lucky, you get to work in Hollywood and it's really fun to see your work on screen or just to be part of the whole process because we need entertainment and this COVID thing, you know, you, you, and, and for forever entertainment's such a valuable thing. It's a lifesaver. It's like food, shelter. And then the next thing is like entertainment could be religion for you, but you know, it was the, it used to be the theater. Now it's movies and TV for, and Netflix and stuff. So there's a lot of people want content. And if you want to be one of those people providing content, love it and be grateful for the opportunity. Cause there's a lot of other people behind you who would love that opportunity and they'll do anything for it. That's, you know, if I have any regrets about my careers that I didn't put more into understanding how lucky I was, being grateful, being nice to everyone, and just not passing up opportunities and thinking, oh, this is going to go on forever. It's not, and it's a precious, lucky thing. I'm really lucky that I survived and that I come back into it. Now I really appreciate it. Thanks.
Very well said, John. Oh, thanks. Really appreciate that. I'm sure the audience will, too. I don't know about that. We'll see. Oh, they will, John. They will. They will, John. Yeah, they will. It was so good to see you after 10. No, it's more than that. 13. 13 years. Because our first movie together was in 2007. Yeah. Holy cow. John, thank you so much for having me out here. And thank you for giving the time to fill me in on what's going on with you. You're welcome. (laughs) If you're new to the channel, please subscribe. Hit the notification button below for more interviews coming up. Thank you once again for watching. This is Hans Herky signing out.